The last time I drove a Jeep Wrangler was in 2007, and since then a lot has happened in the world of cars. Saab and Hummer have gone out of business. Hybrid supercars are a reality, as is the available of the internet in cars. And by way of random examples, Audi has built six completely new models. So, what has the Jeep Wrangler done in that time? Well, apart from a few upgrades to the engine and the interior and some special editions, just about nothing. It looks the same, it feels the same, it drives the same, and for that privilege, thanks to the world and its ridiculous economy, you'll pay more than double for this car than you would have paid in 2007 for one with a similar V6 motor. The most obvious place to start is the interior because that's where most of the changes have happened. There's a new instrument cluster, some new materials, some upgraded tech. And although that sounds great, it did happen quite a while ago. And I get the feeling the Jeep upgraded the wrong things. It's been a long-held belief of mine that the interior of a Jeep Wrangler has the most dim-witted engineering of any car. A four-door convertible is a rare thing. But it's such an immense pain in the buttocks to get it to its open top state, and so impractical once it's there, that never taking the roof off is a far more attractive proposition. There is no button to press, there's no simple three-step procedure to take the roof off. Instead, just a mind-numbing, muscle-wrenching, ten-step operation. And that's just to remove the front panels. The rear section just about needs its own workshop and crew, and then when it's all off, you have to leave it all behind. And it doesn't end there. The fold-away soft top that's included in the 490,000 Rand asking price of this car allows you to keep dry in the event of a sudden shower, but it cuts the loading aperture in half. Then there are the doors, where Jeep, in some random fit of idiocy, have replaced latching hinges with tethers, which simply means that unless the Wrangler is parked on an absolutely level surface, the doors either swing open or slam shut unless you hold them in place. Well, let's hit the road. Maybe once we're moving, I'll change my mind about this. Ow! There are two engine options for the Jeep Wrangler Unlimited, a diesel or the 209 kilowatt 3.6 V6 petrol in our test car. Both are fitted with a five-speed automatic gearbox and all-wheel drive. A lot of big SUVs, even those hardcore 4x4s, have gotten on-road bias. And by that, I mean their all-wheel drive systems are there more to help with cornering and stability rather than driving over rocks and small animals. This is not one of those cars. In fact, you only have to drive a few hundred meters to realize that this thing would be a lot happier in the dirt. Its size is amplified by its squishy suspension. It feels bouncy over rougher tar surfaces and quite wallowy in general. It's not what you'd call a very enjoyable ride setup, although despite its size, it is quite easy to maneuver thanks to good steering. Just a hint though, unlike almost every modern car on the road, the Jeep's extremities lie out of sight, which means you have to leave a little extra room for, by way of example, the front fenders, which you can't see unless you lean forward. By now, you can probably tell I'm not the world's biggest Jeep Wrangler fan. It has its impracticalities, it's not particularly nice to drive, and thanks to its resemblance to something built in 1942, it's not particularly eye-catching either. But it does have its talents. You just need to know where to look. Here's a hint, it's not on tar. Drop the Wrangler into the dust, throw some obstacles in its way, and all of a sudden, this car starts to make sense. It's got 70 years worth of off-road genes running through its system, and when you give it the chance to take on some nature, it really doesn't fail to impress. It even gives you a choice of off-road systems. Command Track splits the torque evenly front to rear and also gives you a low-range gearbox. Rock Track, which is what we've got in this car, also gives you a low-range gearbox, but with much more torque. And lockable front and rear diffs and a system that will disconnect the front anti-roll bar. And it all makes for epic off-road ability. I know what I've said up till this point about the Wrangler being less than impressive, but all of that is almost blown away when you give it the chance to show off its rock climbing, water wading, sand bashing, mud slinging skills. Put it into the kind of environment where it can show off Jeep's decades of accumulated engineering skill, and you can't help but be impressed by this thing. It also brings home something about this car you kind of miss if you don't take it off-road. It has a lot of character. 
It looks like nothing else. It's willfully kicked sand in the face of modern styling and a driver-friendly approach in favor of something that's a little old school, something that says they still make them like they used to. As an everyday on-road machine, the Jeep Wrangler Rubicon is deeply flawed. For the money, there are cars with better ergonomics, more modern looks, a nicer drive, and it has to be said, better fuel economy. But when it comes to its off-road ability and its sheer character, there's hardly anything to touch it. And that means that I may not like it, but I sure as hell respect it. The 3.6 V6 delivers lots of low-down torque, which helps in shifting the big car with relative ease, but it is very thirsty. There are lots of things to point out on the Wrangler that are far from ideal for everyday driving, like the door tethers, but it is absolutely brilliant off-road and you don't get many cars with as much character. <laughs> 